Excuse me, everyone, if I can have your attention, please. Uh, welcome. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, I'm Will Inboden, Executive Director of the Clements Center and Distinguished Scholar with the Strauss Center and affiliated with Intelligence Studies Project. Honored to have all of you here. My only job is to do what you've just done, which is get you seated and quiet and bring up to the stage the man who needs no introduction, Admiral Bob Inman. So. Thank you, Will, and we're delighted to see the size of the crowd. Even more exciting, if you looked, is what's going on down the corridor of the center. This, this is our first ever career day for potential interest in the National Security Arena. Uh, there are 10 different national organizations that have tables down attracting. And happily, we're seeing students from all over the campus coming who've got some interest. You may wonder, why so early? Why now? Especially because if you're going to go to consider even interning at one of the intelligence agencies, it's a long process for getting security clearance. For those of you who are in the audience, enjoy what's going to be there. But if you're interested, the tables will still be open until 3 o'clock. So head down there. Um, this is uh, this effort that brings you here, product of the collaboration between the Clements Center, the Strauss Center, and critically the Intelligence Studies Project. And the LBJ School is happy to be a collaborating partner in all that. Uh, you're going to get the privilege of listening to two experts talk about where are we post 9-11. Tomorrow we will pause to remember 18 years ago. How many of you remember where you were? Let's see, most hands. And of those that don't go up, they probably were two or three years old <laughs> when that occurred. It's like the handful of us still around can remember December the 7th, 1941. Catastrophic event that's burned into your memories for the rest of your lives. So what do you do about all that? How do you respond to it? What are the strategies in place? Do they work? Have they worked? Will they work going forward? Um, a lot of Americans have died at the hands of terrorists. Uh, before 9-11 and increasingly afterwards as well. Setting aside the close to 3,000 who lost their lives on 9-11. Um, we've adapted, hopefully, to meet the threat. We're now at a period with a new strategy which doesn't lower terrorism as an interest, but in fact broadens the focus back to Russia, China, and terrorism along the way. You're we have four principal architects of our time. And I'm not going to give you their history, because that's the role of the moderator, our esteemed Paul Pope, who will do that. Um, but I would if, uh, and trying to remember if I've left anything out of my kind notes that Steve Slick had given me, and I'm having my usual trouble getting paper to respond. When you're 88 years old, that happens more frequently. Um, it's simply to introduce the people. So please, John, forgive me if I violate protocol. Senior. Bill McRaven, Professor McRaven, Admiral, Chancellor, whatever. Uh, <laughs> John Brennan, former Director of Central Intelligence, but important to us as a distinguished non-resident scholar at UT. Nick Rasmussen, who was a senior fellow of Clements and Strauss, and Farah Pandit, whose new book has just been released, and stand by, she'll be happy to autograph it for you after the session. So I'm going to let Paul do the detailed introductions. May I please invite the panelists to come to the stage. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon. As Admiral Inman said, we have a distinguished panel of architects of what we've done since 9-11, not just participants. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on introductions because each one of them has done not only um, single jobs that are really important, but multiple jobs in the world of, of counterterrorism. Um, but we have on the panel uh, former National Security, everybody's a veteran of the National Security Council, I believe, up here, for one thing. Um, and I think you were mostly there together at the same time at one point in time, is that right? Um, Close. So in, in addition to all the other important jobs that were done, uh, they have that in that shared uh, experience. Um, Nick has been the, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center, his most recent job, but before that he was a um, senior person on the National Security Council doing terrorism, a distinguished career before that that I, I'll refer you to the, uh, the document you have. I'm going to let, if you, if you read the excellent book that Faraz written, you'll find out a lot about her background, and um, I'll, I hope you can weave some of why you think what you think about countering violent extremism, I mean, some of your, your story uh, into that. Today, we've had a theme of public service, and so we've spent some time talking to students about not only uh, counterterrorism and, and national security issues, but also a career in public service. Uh, Admiral Bill McRaven needs no introduction to UT folks. Um, he, you know, all you have to do is say, make your bed or something, and everybody knows um, <laughs> who I'm talking about. Uh, if you haven't read his most recent book, I, I was telling him before here that I shared his book with a very old, been over 86-year-old guy that I know and love, and, uh, and he read it, and he came back, and I said, what'd you think of it? He said, I loved it. It's a great book. Tell you, I really loved it. He said, but it made me cold. And I said, well, you really are a frog man, <laughs> because, because he, knew, he knows the real deal. And then John Brennan, former director of CIA, um, and a number of other important uh, jobs, including in the Obama White House, um, John and I first met um, when I was on the National Intelligence Council in the 80s. We were just talking about how young everybody looks and, and uh, <laughs> what, <laughs> where they were. When we, they weren't around when we were doing this. I want to go ahead and get started because we have a limited amount of time, and we, each one of these panelists could, could take the full amount of time and keep us captivated talking about uh, this issue given their expertise. But what I thought I would do is start with... Um, Director Brennan and Rasmussen, Nick Rasmussen, director of NCTC, former director, and ask how, what's changed? I mean, I think everybody has kept up with terrorism, but what is the nature of the phenomenon now? How has it changed? What challenges do we have? And what does that mean for us um, going forward? I'll start with John, you would. Well, maybe I'll start, and I'm, I'm holding my phone not because I'm not paying attention, but because I wanted to read one sentence, and I didn't want to get it wrong, so I thought I'd, I'd hold my phone and get it right. The Center for Strategic uh, International Studies in Washington, a think, a think tank, CSIS, last fall published a study, and the signature line at the top of that study said the following. Despite nearly two decades of US-led counterterrorism operations, there are nearly four times as many Sunni Islamic militants today as there were on September 11, 2001. And I cite that statistic not to frighten people or to try to hype the threat. And again, sometimes when I was the director of National Counterterrorism Center, it was my job to go in front of various audiences and explain the threat as we understood it. And often I could be accused of hyping that threat, cataloging all the different ways in which we were at risk at, at home and around the world. That stat doesn't make me, on its own, you know, feel any worse about the threat, in part because we've done so much as a nation since 9-11 to increase our defenses, to, to make ourselves a hard target, to increase our capability to go play both offense and defense in our counterterrorism operations around the world. But I cite that statistic because I think it's an important statistic to remember as you think about where terrorism and counterterrorism fit into the broader national security landscape. And I know that's a direction Paul wanted to take us in with this panel today. Because if you are working in the counterterrorism domain, what that statistic tells me is that you're not going anywhere. This, issue this feature, this phenomenon is going to be a central feature, not the only feature, but a central feature of our national security landscape for the foreseeable future. And I would say the foreseeable future to me means certainly a 10 to 20 year time horizon. And why is that important? Um, that's important for a couple of reasons. One, it's important because the work we do in counterterrorism, while important, is expensive. Um, the money we have spent as a country, the resources we continue to vote to this, to this problem, um, don't come cheaply. 
Um, they don't come cheaply in terms of uh, the lives of young men and women who, who sacrifice their lives to defend us around the world, but also to build the kind of exquisite intelligence and defense capabilities needed to allow CIA to do what it does, to allow our special operations community to do what it does, again, doesn't come cheaply. And so as we enter a period where the terrorism problem sits alongside half a dozen other really, really pressing national security issues, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, cyber threats, um, what that tells you is that we will have to have a more sophisticated and intelligent conversation about resource allocation across our different problem sets. Not that we're gonna get out of the business of counterterrorism, but how do we do it in a way that is smarter? Because I think my, this generation of new counterterrorism officials entering public service now will be the first ones that actually have to deal with resources uh, in either a flat or a declining environment. My successor in my role as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center uh, Vice Admiral Retired Joe McGuire is the first person to occupy that role who I suspect won't get everything he asks for just because he asked for it. Um, because there will be competing pressures on personnel, on budget resources, on talent in the community. And so we are going to have to, in my mind, be smarter about how we do countering extremism work and counterterrorism work. Of course, that gets to some of the themes that, that Farah will bring out uh, that are very well developed in her book. Last thing I'll say on this before uh, flipping it to my good friend John Brennan is that for most Americans now, if you're talking about the terrorism set of issues, you are at least as much thinking about domestic terrorism as you are thinking about jihadists, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, which has, of course, been the, the kind of the stock and trade of our business for most of the period since 9-11. And that's as it should be, because of course that's the problem that here inside the United States seems to be the most pressing. It is certainly that form of terrorism that has cost the most American lives in recent years. It is that form of terrorism that if you listen to FBI Director Ray, has caught up in terms of the caseload that the FBI, FBI manages around the country. Um, and so that's something that I would argue, and we can talk about this again later in the conversation, our government is not as well postured to deal with that form of terrorism as we are postured to deal with the form of international terrorism that we've uh, been dealing with in the period since 9-11. Right now, when we talk about domestic terrorism, most of the federal government agencies push back from the table and look at the FBI and say, over to you guys, because we treat it as a law enforcement problem and a law enforcement challenge. And we don't bring the same whole of government spirit that we bring to the terrorism problem when we're talking about ISIS or Al Qaeda we're managing our set of problems around the world in places like Afghanistan or Yemen or Iraq or Syria. So I'll leave it there. Happy to come back to any of these themes as we go through the conversation. Everything he said, <laughs> I agree with. Um, but let me point out one thing that has changed and one thing that has stayed the same from my perspective since 9-11. One thing that really has changed significantly is that I believe it's much more difficult for terrorist groups to operate internationally now than it was back in 9-11 because of the tremendous advancements in intelligence collection and sharing, not just within the U.S. federal government, but with state and locals, but also with countries around the world. There is a tremendous flow of information in terms of um, who's involved in these various terrorist groups and actions to prevent them from operating either physically across borders or even in that digital domain because of tremendous capabilities that have been brought to bear by a, a series of administrations since 9-11 that have tried to build upon some of those early efforts to, to prevent and to make much more difficult these terrorist groups operating internationally. What has happened with some of these groups is that they have burrowed into some of the, the local environments. So for example, Al-Qaeda in Yemen is engaged in basically a civil war inside of Yemen. They don't have, at least right now, the same extent of their international sort of objectives that they had before. They're consumed with some of the local issues, whether it be inside of Yemen or Syria, Iraq, or even places in, in Africa. So I just think that there has been great progress. Uh, certainly this country is much more difficult for terrorist groups to operate in today, uh, foreign terrorist groups, than it was back in 9-11. Not saying it's impossible, nothing is ever impossible, but there has been tremendous progress made. The thing that has stayed the same when I look out over the, the global stage that I was involved in, uh, there's still in many countries of the world, particularly in the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, tremendous amounts of economic deprivation, political discontent, social injustice, other types of things that are now being still repressed by governments 
that are trying to prevent uh, a uh, development of sort of democratic principles in some of these countries. So they're continuing to suppress these um, this opposition groups within those countries. And similar to in the 9-11 period of time, the only available outlet for a lot of these individuals is to gravitate towards some of these groups that have a real purported religious foundation, uh, extremism. When I was growing up back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, you had secular groups. You had Baathism and Nasserism and socialism and communism, and you had these efforts to try to you know, gain some type of political traction through the secular organizations. You look now throughout the Middle East, you know, the, all those other isms went away. It's just you know, the extremism that is associated with those individuals who again purport to be trying to carry out a religious banner under you know, whether it be an Islamic banner or a Hindu banner or someone else. So um, as Nick was pointing out, um, I think we still have a lot of challenges out there how to deal with the violent expression of these groups who are upset about what's going on because of the corruption, because of the, again, the, the political uh, suppression that is going on in their countries. And too often, a lot of these individuals who, again, purport to be uh, religious zealots are able to galvanize people in support of their aims and have a violent expression. And so, um, as was pointed out earlier, it's not just a question of being able to address the, uh, the violent manifestations of this phenomenon. It is trying to understand and to address better those upstream factors and conditions that really contribute to that violent expression that comes out of those terrorist and extremist organizations. This is going to, I think, you know, uh, challenge us for many, many years to come. And that's why in the intelligence community and CIA and other places, yes, we need to keep thinking about what's going on with Russia or China, North Korea, whatever else, but the globe has just a wide array of challenges and uh, groups that are going to try to advance their interests by using violence, in some, some instances, catastrophic violence if they can do it, something that the intelligence community need to be continuing to working on and cannot think that we're past this challenge. Yeah, I, if, if I could just um, paraphrase a couple of things that came out of this. I mean, I, I think we have this fundamental contradiction that we have not had a major attack like 9-11 since 9-11, and yet we have the numbers that you're describing, Nick. And so um, if you read the national security strategy or the defense strategy, we have explicitly what we're referring to in the strategies said counterterrorism is not the, prior, it's not the top priority. So these other near state, uh, near peer states are, are the, uh, the priority for defense. So with that, in mind, I want to switch to sort of what do we do about it or how do we adjust our counterterrorism policy, strategies, tactics, and that kind of thing um, going forward. And I, would, I thought I'd uh, turn to Admiral McRaven first and then Farad to talk to that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Paul. Yeah, when, uh, when I got to the White House in October of 2001, I was a Navy captain, just come out of Major Command, and, and I arrive on the NSC staff. And I am, uh, I'm given the job of being the lead author on the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism. So this was, we are going to defeat terrorism. We're going to defeat terrorism. I thought, okay, so I'm going to put my military strategy together and, and think about it in military terms. And in the course of pulling some great thinkers across the uh, State Department, the intelligence community, uh, National Defense University, pulled all these folks in, we went through a lot. But the best advice I had was actually from a 34-year-old Harvard PhD who happened to be on the staff, uh, the Homeland Security staff, and he said, you're thinking about it all wrong. He said, I, I spent a lot of time in New York City, and, and he worked with kind of disaster response in New York City, particularly fires. He said, you have to think of terrorism like you think about fires. We are never, ever going to eradicate all fires. We just aren't. We'd like to say that there will never be another fire again, but there will be fires. So how do you deal with fire security, fire safety in the city of, of New York? Well, one, you make sure that you address the conditions that cause fire, bad wiring, dilapidated buildings. You want to make sure you've got smoke detectors in the event there is a fire, and then you want to have a fire brigade that can come and put out the fire. Think about it like that. And so when you began to think about, okay, look, let, let's accept the fact that there's never going to be a surrender ceremony on the USS Missouri. Now what we have to figure out is how do we address, to John's point, the underlying conditions, what's kind of causing the fires, it's not always about poverty. If it was about poverty, then you'd find Haiti to be a hotbed of terrorism. 
but it is about social conditions, so how do you address that? What are the smoke detectors? What does is, what is our intelligence community look like? How are we going to determine whether or not smoke is building and a fire is building? And then do we have the forces, the counterterrorism forces, the law enforcement forces, the soft power to be able to go in and address the terrorism problem? So once you begin to kind of take a look at it uh, in that framework, then you can begin to see maybe how best to uh, address the problem. Having said that, we laid that all out in the National Strategy for Combating Terrorism. I think five people probably read it, <laughs> uh, me being one of them. Uh, having said that, I think it was a good strategy because a lot of it was about by, with, and through. It was about recognizing, we use this term, particularly in the special forces, the Green Berets like to talk about by, with, and through. In other words, what we need to do is we need to work with the host nation to teach their forces, their security forces, their law enforcement forces, their embassy folks, how best to address the problems. Let them do it. We need to be coaching and mentoring, but at the end of the day, it's going to be about a, a problem generally within a confined piece of territory. Work it by, with, and through. And then, of course, you're always looking at the difference between capability and intent. And a lot of times, we have gone after uh, terrorist organizations that had all the intent in the world, but frankly, had very little capability. And then you go and you, you waste a lot of your resources tracking down folks that may have intent but not capability. So how do, you, how do you make sure you're prioritizing those that have capability and intent and then working by, with, and through? And I think that model in general is still good. It has certainly served us well in light of the fact that we have not had a major attack on, on U.S. soil. So I think we've made some tremendous strides since 9-11. Uh, but anybody that thinks that this war is going to be over soon uh, is mistaken. Uh, this is, as I've said many times before, this is a generational fight. Uh, it's, we're going to be fighting fires for as long as there are people on the earth, and, and those fires could get worse. Well, that's a great segue to for us. So one of the things that's important in everything that you've heard is the, um, the attention to detail in terms of what you need to do to fight, to fight a war. Um, and the war that we are fighting, from my perspective, is a war of us versus them ideology. And we have been lazy on hate and lazy on the ideology component of what we've seen since 9-11. Let me be clear, we are talking about 9-11, so some of the threat, a lot of the threat, is coming from terrorist organizations that use the name of Islam to recruit young Muslims. But they're not the only extremists that are out there. And today, almost 20 years since 9-11, the kind of extremist threat we're dealing with uh, is not just a group like AQ or the so-called Islamic State or the Taliban or Boko Haram, but we also now see uh, the rise of other kinds of extremists. The work that I've been doing since 9-11 has been focusing on the young people, and, I, and the majority of the people I'm looking at the audience, I think, are under the age of 30, um, millennials and Generation Z. You are the demographic from which the bad guys recruit. And in going to nearly a, a hundred countries on behalf of our nation as special representative to Muslim communities and talking to young Muslims, the only data point that I saw consistently for Muslims living in Muslim majority countries and Muslims living as minorities is the issue of identity, identity and belonging. And I say this because this goes to the issue of preventing fires. How do you build prevention if you don't understand what we're dealing with? How do you get young kids to own their identity in such a way that the bad guys can't come in and suck you in. That's the job we have to fight. That's what we need to be doing. Not just the kinetic component, which is essential, but to understand as government that in order to win this, to get not every terrorist away uh, from, the, from the world, but to change the vast number of young people who find it interesting to join a group like Al-Qaeda or ISIS. And the only way to do that is to understand that the strategy means hard power and soft power combined. Nick started by, by quoting something from CSIS, and, and I am not part of CSIS, but I was part of a commission that found this number out, which I think is really sobering. In the fight against the so-called Islamic State, the US government spent 0.0138% of its budget on trying to prevent recruitment. 0.0138%. We obviously know that in order to destroy the bad guys, we gotta make sure that they don't have armies. And it costs us less to do that. Yet the US government since 9-11 has not deployed an effective, all-encompassing, cohesive, strategic, global, effort on soft power. So the way to win this and what we need to do 
is to make sure that we are addressing this in an equal-handed equal way. We need to understand that the issue of identity and belonging is not the responsibility of just government. It's the responsibility of all of us. So I argue that the strategy that we need to think about is how to puncture the us versus them in communities around the world, not just in our country, because from my perspective, it's not a domestic threat versus an international threat. If you're a millennial sitting in Detroit or in Dhaka, you are, you are online and you're connected. Ideas have no borders. You can't build an idea wall. So what do we have to do? We have to think about how to deploy government in new ways, and, and you talked about the organization of how we do that, the money that we need to do it, and we could go into great detail about all the things that we know and we've learned that the US government needs to do. But we also need to talk to corporations, technology companies, yes, but other corporations to think about how they are touch, the touch points that they have in terms of how a young person thinks about themselves. There is a grand place for corporate uh, purpose in all of this. And finally, and this sounds like the mushy gushy stuff that government <laughs> cannot deal with, they don't have metrics for, it's really awful. How do you get societies to fight hate? I mean, really, we're going to go around talking about compassion and empathy and being good to each other. Really, truly, we're going to measure this. Turns out you can measure it. And it turns out that cities across America and the world have begun to think about how to recalibrate this. And this is connected to the issue of what's happening in America today on the rise of hate. Because if you're a young kid and you're 16 years old and you're growing up in school and you are feeling like everybody is against you, you are more susceptible to the kind of ideology, whether it's an identitarian, or whether it's the Taliban, or Boko, or pick your group. And finally, the last piece is this. We're talking in a static moment here on September 10th, 2019. Our job ha has been to think not just for now, but what's coming. And if we're gonna build the antibodies in the system to prevent young kids, our kids, from joining these kinds of groups, we better get serious about the soft power component, and we aren't ready for that. Thank you. Um, that's a, we wanna come back to a lot of that. I, I, wanna, I wanna, before we go forward looking at the future, I wanna, I wanna pause for a second and look back to 9-11 uh, for just a minute and, and asking a particular question, and I'm gonna go back to Captain McRaven writing the strategy. Um, it's very clear if you listen to the Admiral that he understood that we couldn't kill our way out of that problem. And, he, and I'm sure you understood that. And that was a, that's, a, that's a phrase that I heard many times uh, over the last two decades. We can't kill our way out of this. Yeah. People have long understood that we needed to have this other strategy. And a lot has been written, and there were a lot of meetings, and a lot of things were done. So I'm going to come back to you and say, how do we organize that? And then, well, let me ask another question before that. Does it take a catastrophe for us to make the changes? Or is this moment when we're re-examining strategy enough maybe to at least make some progress on that? And then second, how do we organize that in the government? And I want the others to comment on that, but I wanted to come back to you for your thoughts on it. Um, I, I think that in the, your immediate response as a human is, of course, a calamity is going to make everybody do everything right. And we have learned as Americans, uh, time and time, and I'm not getting political here, I'm just giving you points. You would have thought after Newtown that we would have changed the way we think about guns, a little bit, okay? You would have thought after um, you know, the, 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 the fires in the, in the rainforest decades ago that we would have learned how to handle that. We would have thought with uh, a health crisis uh, like HIV AIDS that we would have been able to handle the bird flu in a different way. I mean, you know, we, we have had calamities, but our response system has been slow and it's been ad hoc. And it has not been a 24-7 machine. And so how we handle it today is not waiting, God forbid, for another 9-11. It's for leadership to think through who we want to be and how to get there. Uh, and, and I think that that is possible. I think that there are lots of innovative, smart, intelligent, well-meaning uh, people in our government today who are capable of building that kind of long-term plan. It needs two things right now. Um, is, one is leadership from the top that says soft power matters and puts their money where their mouth is. This is not just the executive branch. I'm calling on Congress as well when I say this. What were you waiting for? 
to give money to the soft power components of our government. And then the second is, and, and, and this is, with every plan that you build in, in the hard power domain, there is one person who wakes up every single day and knows where every satellite is, where every submarine is, where every troop is. There is no one in the US government today, and nor has there been since 9-11, who wakes up and whose job it is to know how to deploy soft power. That is unbelievable. You cannot solve this problem if there's no leadership. Thank you. I'd like others to comment on that. Nick, did you have some? Let me jump in on the kind of the broader strategy question because again, um, I, I was sat alongside Bill at the time he was writing that, that fire prevention strategy in, in 2001. And I, was, I had my fingerprints on, on strategy documents in, in, in other administrations. And as I look back on that, I look back on that with a lot of humility because I think um, where I see things now is very different from where I, see, I saw things then. I very much embrace the kind of prevention agenda that Farah is talking about because I, when, when we've written strategies in the past, we've used very big words. We've used words like defeat and destroy and win, when in, when in effect, as I think Bill had that, that kind of um, epiphany that that really wasn't an achievable objective and that the goal ought to be to manage, to mitigate, to shrink, to contain, to kind of bring the problem down to the, to the size where it can be not an existent, certainly not an existential threat to the United States, but not even a preoccupying um, feature of our national security um, landscape. And to me, that ought to be the objective rather than using these somewhat unattainable, and I would argue in the end, misleading to the American public words that somehow suggest that if we just do X, Y, and Z in four years time, we will be past our set of terrorism problems and, and concerns. When again, I. I spoke about two years ago at my 30th college reunion, and, and I was a recipient of an award there, and I said my goal um, working on counterterrorism is to make you in this audience not think about what I do, and to not to have me worry about it along with my colleagues in government whose responsibility it is, but for you to be able to live your life without reference to what I do. Go to that 4th of July parade, go to that picnic, go to that football game without thinking about the security environment on that evening at that place. That to me is an attainable objective, and you don't have to identify and eliminate and remove every terrorist or extremist from the face of the earth in order to achieve that objective. But achieving that objective does involve the soft power tools that Farah is talking about. And in many cases, the federal government will simply be a catalyst or an enabler to communities around the country and, and arguably around the world in doing that kind of work. Um, it's not a single program from Washington that is going to make communities all, all across this country more resilient. It is, it is the, the, the government can provide resources, the government can provide expertise and, and backing, but in the end, this is a community level responsibility in many ways, and particularly when I'm talking about the set of domestic terrorism concerns I alluded to at the beginning, a lot of that responsibility will fall locally, not at the Washington level. Did you want any comment on that, Director Brennan? Very good. <clears throat> Yes, I think I do. Um, I, I very much appreciate and applaud Farah's um, representation of trying to orchestrate soft power. There is a person in the United States government responsible for that. First of all, it's the President of the United States, but then it's the Secretary of State as well. Secretary of the State is one who's supposed to be able to make sure that the United States' presence around the world is going to be as effective um, as, as possible. It's really hard. It, you know, it, and the United States' ability to actually influence events overseas is limited. And I came to realize that in a very, very profound way when I worked at the White House and the CIA and others. We can do certain types of things. But also, as the United States goes into different countries, we're viewed as this sovereign power who now has changed over the last several years in terms of our own goals and objectives. And there is a taint, rightly or wrongly, with the U.S. hand that's coming into the countries because they feel as though this is just the exploitation by those current day imperial powers. When I was at the White House, as well as at CIA, I really was a strong advocate and worked with the ICRC, it's National Committee of the Red Court, Cross, that has this independence as well as a reputation of doing things not because they're trying to advance the interests of an individual power or country, it's because they're trying to do it for the betterment of humanity. And I do think trying to deal with some of these issues as we look across the globe over the next you know, decades, that 
And it's very unfortunate that there has been a diminishment of emphasis on multilateral institutions and initiatives in the last couple of years. Because I do think we have to take that sovereign aspect out of some of this and try to do things that are going to be really not just viewed as for the betterment of society and mankind, but truly are, which has to have more of an independent, unbiased sort of approach to some of these issues. And the United States, I think, has a particularly important role of trying to lead this effort on behalf of the world and of Western societies and liberal democratic order. But unfortunately, I think we have taken a step back because uh, you know, we're never going to be, fight, be able to fight our way out of this, but we're also not going to be able to dictate solutions to these countries that are still beset by all these problems. And until we start to work with the private sector, but also with these international bodies and not disparage them, but actually try to lift them up and leverage them for the good of all, I think we're going to be you know, um, fighting a, a, almost a futile effort, war. Anything else? Okay. Um, I wanted to shift to um, some individual agencies. And, and if, Nick, if you want to jump in, please do. But NCTC sort of exists. It's got terrorism in its name. But if you're SOCOM or you're CIA, um, you know, you've, you've played a huge role in, in counterterrorism and still have a huge role to play. But then these other missions that we were talking about earlier um, come in. So how do, you, how do you reconcile that? And let me start with, with SOCOM. What, I mean, is the resource picture okay? Or, or how do you approach that, Admiral? Yeah, one, I think the resource picture today is absolutely okay. But I want to get back to something uh, Farah said. Uh, because frankly, at SOCOM, there is this expectation that you know, we're a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Uh, and, and I think that is a very misleading uh, view of the way Special Operations Command work. One, again, we have this Green Beret sort of culture. And, and for those of you that understand the history of the Green Beret fighting insurgencies, there's a lot of similarity between insurgencies and terrorism. Uh, and the insurgency model that we have used over the years that kind of comes from the British melee model and others is actually a good model. Uh, I mean, you struggle with it in Iraq and you struggle with it in Afghanistan, but you understand that you have to have this balance between soft power and hard power. You have to go in, you have to build a relationship with the village elders or the tribal leaders. You've got to figure out how do you address the underlying conditions that cause the extremists to come in. So you're going to say, so where can we help you with wells and schools and, and building you know, the stature of your community? But at the same time, make no mistake about it, the bad guys are trying to kill the village elders and they are trying to kill the tribal leaders. So somebody on the outside has got to be able to provide that security. That is hard power. So in the midst of looking at it locally, work with the village elders, but at the same time, you better put up gun positions and you better go out and, and kill the bad guys so that the village can begin to grow. And then, we, we used to call it the old Inspot technique, you know, you're gonna start with one village, you're gonna connect it with another village and another, and you're gonna go from the village to the district, to the province, to the central government. Now, if you think about that model, and you think about terrorism worldwide as a pan-surgency, a global insurgency, then at least it gives you an intellectual framework to think about it. But in the special operations community, the first thing we wanna do is go in and figure out what can we do to build uh, boreholes, wells in Mali, so that we can, again, buy down some of the conditions where the extremists come in. Uh, how can we work with the locals to address some of these issues? Because we have money to do that. But then, at the same time, you've got to be prepared to balance that with hard power so that the, the goodness within the white spaces and the green spaces can grow. And, and I think that's true of any sort of uh, approach you're going to have to take with terrorism. I, I um, having been an Army guy, I have that sort of Green Beret view of, of, of SOCOM. But I also think that the, uh, the commanders that are responsible for China and Russia would, would, would want you to be thinking about that as of well and, and working on it. And I'm just wondering, is there anything uh, you could tell us about how, how that should be balanced or could be balanced or is being balanced now as we go forward in the new defense era that we're in? Well, I, I mean, one of the things I'm quick to point out is special operations forces are not the panacea to all, to all problems. I mean, we can't stop the North Koreans from coming uh, south. We can't uh, keep the Straits of Hormuz open. We can't keep the Straits of Malacca open. There are things that special operations forces can't do uh, or won't do very, very well. So we become a supporting commander to uh, U.S. Forces Korea or to the Central Command. Or, and I think we know how to do that very, very well. We have to understand where our niche is, our niche is within the special operations arena, within the counterinsurgency and the counterterrorism arena, and I think we do that very well and we balance that well. 
Um, but at the end of the day, there are large wars that will require special operations forces, but we will follow the lead of those uh, conventional forces that know how to do that best. Director Brennan, what about the agency and other IC community um, balancing this, this inside? It's been a challenge for the agency for ever since its founding. Right. Uh, that the CIA has global responsibilities, and uh, at any given point in time, uh, some parts of that globe are very hot and others are not so hot. And so you need to be able to pivot to deal with the challenges that emerge. But what you can't do is to you know, neglect the rest of that globe because the United States has, is unique um, in that it has global um, equities, global responsibilities, and the CIA is expected to you know, provide insights if you know, look at Venezuela, what's happening there, uh, other parts of, of the world. So you cannot neglect those areas. And I think over the course of our history, there have been times where we have you know, drawn down significantly and precipitously some of those collection capabilities, whether they be human sources or technical collection systems or liaison relationships, that all of a sudden, for whatever reason, that part of the world heats up again. So although the emphasis in this administration is looking at those you know, big power relationships, uh, that always has been a focus of CIA, but to the point we're talking about earlier, you cannot forget that the Middle East and South Asia and Africa are rife with these types of you know, problems regarding stability and terrorism and other things. So it's up to CIA leaders to decide, given your allocation of resources, how you're going to distribute that, how you're going to make some of that you know, fungible, and how you're going to move things, but anticipate what you need to continue to invest in because looking out over the next several years, you know sure as heck that CIA is going to be asked to do certain types of things that if you were to take those investments out, you're not going to be able to do it. I wanted to shift. Several uh, folks have mentioned domestic terrorism, and I wanted to talk about that for, for a minute. You talked about how extremism isn't just um, foreign jihadist. Um, I was talking to Bobby Chesney about this recently, and, and from an authority's perspective, it's like taking hockey sticks to a basketball game. I mean, it's really different. It's not, you know, CIA. You didn't say that. That's my thing, okay? But, uh, but, but the he, he was he's very sophisticated. But, um, <laughs> but the the um, you know CIA can't be in the lead on that. JSOC is not going to be playing a big role in that. So. I think there are lessons that can be learned, and, and sharing information is one of them, and, and, and enterprise leadership and other things are there's some kind of soft lessons that we can take. But w how do we stand now to, uh, the, the Bureau has done great work and is doing great work, but how should we shift now to think about domestic terrorism, and are we in good shape on that? Well, I'll take a stab at that, because I have been doing some writing and thinking on this topic in, in recent months, and again, it. It starts from a place of huge admiration and respect for exactly what you just said, Paul, the FBI, because I think the FBI is the preeminent law enforcement organization in the world as far as I'm concerned. But my argument or complaint is certainly not with them. It has been with the fact that we've kind of left the playing field to them and to them alone in terms of dealing with this set of domestic terrorism concerns. And so how do we broaden that effort out so that it is a truly whole of government effort so that you involve all of our domestic agencies, including agencies that wouldn't typically be involved in national security work, home, not just Homeland Security, which obviously is, but Department of Education, um, uh, Health and Human Services, parts of our government that have reach into the mental health system at the state, national, and local level. All of these parts of our government, our federal government, have a role to play in dealing with the kind of community resilience problems Farah has been talking about. And, and, in, and all of these organizations, all of these government um, um, components have potentially resources they can bring to bear that would aid in this so-called prevention agenda. But it has to be led and directed from the center, and that's what I worry is not necessarily happening right now. Not too long ago, I was um, I'm talking to some senior Department of Homeland Security officials who were, were stepping through for me and a couple of other people. Um, all of the things they at DHS are doing to try to bring real urgency to this domestic terrorism problem. Um, because I think at DHS, there are, in fact, um, people who want to do the right things and want to bring urgency to this. But they're not necessarily certain that they're doing so as part of a national effort and that they are part of, that they're plugged into something that is a, a 
White House-led or an NSC-led or Homeland Security Council-led effort. And I, and I think that, that would not only be a, 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 much, a much needed step towards greater U.S. government effort at the federal level, it would also send a powerful message to the American people that we are not just simply going to let these events happen every six weeks, every eight weeks, throw up our hands and say, well, you know, there, there it is again but that we're actually going to try to take some steps and mobilize some resources to do something about it. Because imagine this, if, if, if each of those attacks over the last six months had involved a, a jihadist uh, from, you know, tied to ISIS or Al-Qaeda, we'd be having a very different response, a very different public debate about where we are on, in our war on, on terrorism uh, than, than we have been having be, because these issues are labeled as domestic. And I think that's, that's not fair to the American people. They should expect more of their leaders in Washington. Well, there are a couple of things. One is um, the scare. The, on top of everything else that Nick talked about, one of the things that's also scary is that um, the threat isn't just staying as it is, right? These organizations are learning from each other. And even though they may hate each other, um, if you're a white supremacist organization here in the United States, you're looking at the playbook of the so-called Islamic State because you're saying, how did they use the online space to radicalize and sway people in a particular direction? It sounds absurd, but if you're, if you're a bad guy, and you want to learn how to do things and do it well, you go to the successful models that are out there. So we're looking at a threat today that is a 50-state problem. Um, and in 2016, I mean, I would turn everybody's attention to the fact that there is, in fact, a, uh, a, the, the CVE task force that, that Jay Johnson put together came up with a 50-state plan that does all the state things that Nick just said about different parts of government taking part in this, thinking about this in a cohesive manner, not just looking at isolated parts of America in terms of what's happening, and, and importantly, not just isolated parts in the, United, uh, in, the, in the world that people think, oh, you know, that's dangerous and that's dangerous because, as I said, ideas have no borders and they're connected. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, when I think about um, the solutions here that are, by the way, at our fingertips and are affordable and available right now. Uh, I think about something that, that uh, Ms. Rennan was saying in terms of the localized communities. This isn't a top-down uh, effort only. This has to be from the bottom up because the nuance and the um, the very particular influence at a particular city or neighborhood makes a difference to how people absorb who they are, their identity, their belonging to that space. And I think on the domestic side, we need to get real as Americans about what it is we want to live with. What is OK? And, and is it all right to be in an environment in which um, we are not just seeing a political conversation about us versus them, but it's manifesting in the fourth graders or the 10th graders or the college freshmen and, uh, around our country that's changing the way they think about themselves because that opens up space for, for others. And the, the, the domestic terrorist organizations in our country today that were really small at one point that have now gained agency and have monopolized the conversation both offline and online are learning from the very best around the world and that's what frightens me the most because um, like like some of the groups that learned from the horrific events in on July 22nd in Oslo you will see things that begin in America make a difference to another part of the world. And then we will be the country that, that we will turn into the Saudi Arabia uh, of the world on this kind of threat. Because we will have seen it grow, uh, spread, mature, and radicalize in a way that we had never seen. And it's having an effect in pick your country somewhere, somewhere else. We haven't thought through what that's actually going to even mean for us. So when I look at all of this, um, I see a dangerous moment in time. But I think it, there is an opportunity, Paul, that we are not talking about. And that is, I think the vast majority of Americans believe in who we are as communities of diversity and the strength of what that means. And I think that, that this is a moment where we should be pushing uh, on our elected officials and on our community officials to, to do more around that space. Because I think when you begin to build those kinds of antibodies in, you will see change in a real way. Thank you. <clears throat> some, of the, some of the students that I spoke to last night as well as this morning have already heard this, but you're going to have to hear it again. Um, I'm a liberal arts guy, uh, but I am a wannabe systems engineer. Be because during my 
period of government, I came to realize just how big and powerful the United States government is and how unwieldy it is as well. And as we talk about these issues, whether we're talking about the exercise of soft power abroad or trying to address issues of domestic terrorism or gang violence or other things, you know, Department of Education, Health and Human Services, you know, State Department, SOCOM, Special Forces, other things, having more is not necessarily better unless you design a system that is able to leverage optimally the different parts of that system in an integrated fashion so that you can actually apply those great capabilities, resources, and authorities against those issues. And as I've looked at it, of course, at least my career the last 40 years, there has been explosive growth in capabilities and size of government, but I don't think we have done a sufficient job of trying to design a, the system of systems that's going to allow us to take full advantage of those capabilities. And it's, it's very difficult because as administrations come in, you have usually a new group of folks who are just trying to figure out where's the restroom for the first couple of weeks, and then trying to make sure they understand that, that inventory of capabilities that are out there and how you're going to bring it together. And it's a very dynamic environment as technology continues to change capabilities. And too often, I think we have departmental structures, agency structures, that are not sufficiently interoperable and integrated with the rest of the government. When I look out over the next 20 years, 30 years, this is the challenge for the United States government. How are you going to bring to bear those capabilities that are going to give you the optimal outcomes by leveraging those capabilities you have, as opposed to either sub-optimizing, underutilizing, or in fact competing competition among the various agencies and departments. I don't have a solution to that. And people who are out there who are systems engineers and those who are liberal arts people as well, you really need to be thinking about that environment that you're going to be operating within and how you're going to empower yourself and the rest of that environment by ensuring that there's going to be those relationships that are going to be mutually empowering. <clears throat> um, a, about a year and a half ago, we did a, I led a professional research project and we looked at some very similar questions to what you're discussing right now about the engineering of the systems to go after particular problems. And what we found was in the world on terrorism, very relevant, I think, to what we're talking about is, if you want to see what an exquisite interagency machine can look like, look, look at our manhunting machine that we put together. It was, it's pretty impressive. We didn't have something like that on the other side. I want to ask you just a quick kind of a poll question, because what I'm hearing, I think, implicit in your, in your comments is, optimism that we can do it that there's you know that we it's it's hard but that it is a doable thing to make a lot of progress in this area if we turn our mind to it and make it a a, a priority of government with leadership so let me start with you you're not in your head the most so i spent are you the optimistic last, or pessimistic i spent the last three years of my life um writing this book because i believe we can we can do exactly what we um, we can imagine, which is decrease and shrink the appeal of extremist ideology. We have the innovation, we have the talent, we just don't have the will. If we get the will on board, of course we can. Nick, what do you think? My optimism is tied to, as was said earlier, what's going on in that hallway outside, and that is I think still the national security enterprise is still able to attract the very best young men and women who want to serve their country, want to serve their fellow um, Americans, and so long as that continues unabated, I think some of the structural problems John rightly points to, um, we stand a much better chance of addressing those with those young people involved in developing solutions. That is not a tomorrow answer, but it is a reason for tremendous optimism over the, the long term. Uh, you've heard me say it a bunch of times before that I am the biggest fan of the millennials you'll ever meet. And I think that surprises folks because you hear this kind of narrative about the millennials that they are entitled and soft. And I'm quick to point out that you never saw them in a firefight in Afghanistan or you never saw them going to school here at the University of Texas at El Paso or Rio Grande or, or Austin. Uh, this is a, a remarkable generation of young men and women. And you take a look at how they mobilize when they get upset. You look at the Parkland shooting and whether or not you agree with the politics, Imagine how they came together to march on Tallahassee, to march on D.C., because they felt passionate about something. I mean, th this is a great trait in the young men and women that are out there. My concern, and you've heard me say this before, I'm often asked in settings like this, what's my number one national security concern? And people always think I'm going to answer that North Korea or Iran, and it's the same every time. It's K through 12 education. Because if we don't get K through 12 education right, then we have all the problems that uh, the FAR is talking about. Because if you're not addressing the issues at that level, 
when they're starting in, in first grade or kindergarten on up, then one, we won't have to worry about national security because we won't have anybody that's thoughtful enough to think about the hard issues. So we've got to get K through 12 right. Uh, we've got to put the effort into there. And then we've got to empower these young men and women that are part of the millennials and Gen Z to, to do what they are going to do so very, very well. Brennan, you. As a, as a wife who is focused on zero to five education, I would say don't discount those, those before yeah. they even get to kindergarten yeah, because true, true. especially in inner cities and other places, yeah. you need to be able to make them uh, compete. Yeah. Um, as a grandfather, I can't help but be optimistic um, because I want to make sure that my grandchildren and my grandchildren's grandchildren are going to be able to take as much advantage of this great, wonderful country that I have been so privileged uh, to be a, a part of for many years. But I'm also a very much of a realist and I recognize that the challenges ahead of us are formidable, and they're serious, and they're, some of them are getting worse. Uh, we live in, a, in the most wonderful period of time ever, despite all of these problems. I mean, look at our, our daily lives for most people in a way. There's been tremendous advancements. But there's still a lot of problems and, and issues that are, are out there, which is one of the reasons why I tend to get my Irish up when I, when I talk sometimes about the politics in Washington because I am just appalled at how po politicians on both sides of the aisles are just focused on partisan agendas and trying to advance the interests of themselves or their parties as opposed to doing what's in the best interest of this country. And until we get that right, until we fix that, this government is going to continue to be dysfunctional and we're not going to be able to deal with these challenges as effectively as we need to in the future. And so I'm hoping that there's going to be a realization that this partisan fighting needs to stop and that we need to come together as a country. I know that sounds sort of, you know, Pollyannish, but until we do, we're not going to be able to make progress against any of these issues the way we need to. We have the capability to do it, gets back to the will, but we need to have our leadership set an example for the rest of this country that we are a country of great privilege and great capabilities, but with that comes responsibility and responsibility to the future generations of this country. Can I jump in on just one piece of that? Because one of the encouraging trends, there aren't many encouraging trends in politics these days, but one encouraging trend you have seen is younger professionals, say mid-30s, who've had experience working national security problems are going into politics. They're wanting to bring their talent home and actually do, Will Hurd, your congressman you had here in Texas is a terrific example, but in the last Congress there were easily five, six, seven young such individuals who I served with across my time in government. Tom Malinowski in New Jersey, um, uh, half a dozen others, um, who are deciding that they can bring the same kind of public-spirited commitment um, to domestic politics and politics itself that they brought to their national security work. That's a small step, but I think it's an important step. And you want to see people like that succeed. You want to see them reelected because they bring that kind of sense of nonpartisan partisan, partisanship um, to their domestic work, to their, to their politics, because they've seen that's how it works in the national security world. Well, we want to leave time for questions. I think we have, do we have roving microphones? And um, so we're going to w please wait for the microphone uh, to come to you. And we can start over here with Professor Cooperman, for one. And then there's a student up front here. I want to get a student. Get somebody in uniform, too. Say again. Get somebody in uniform, too. Thank you very much. You talked, uh, Farah, a lot about uh, how important it is to reduce recruiting of radical uh, Islamists around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but the leadership, the main funding of the recruiting of radical uh, Islamists is not being done by our enemies, but is actually being done by a couple countries that are, are among our closest allies, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Now, I understand that those governments, especially in Saudi, they're in a tough position. The royal family has to deal with the religious community and they're riding the tiger and all that. But honest to goodness, we're never going to win that recruiting battle if our allies are the ones that are helping recruit with madrasas and so forth. So why haven't we done a better job at reining in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and how can we do a better job? I promise I did not pay him to ask that question. <laughs> um, there is an entire chapter, in fact, the longest chapter of my book is called Plague from the Gulf, um, in which I, um, I go through what I saw with my own eyes uh, in, as I said, nearly 100 countries around the world, 
When I was at the Department of State, it was impossible for me to speak candidly about what I saw. Uh, despite public um, uh, reports on, uh, on schools that had been funded and other things. Um, what was very shocking for me was that many of my colleagues knew because they too were seeing what I saw, but it was impossible to create the momentum to make Saudi Arabia uh, stop. Uh, I am not the only person who has said if there's only one thing America should do today, to stop the recruitment of young Muslims, it's to get serious with Saudi Arabia. If we did nothing else, and I say that in my book very candidly, not because I'm trying to um, blow up a relationship with a, a partner that has been a partner in many ways and has been um, useful in many ways, but it is impossible for me to see fellow Americans put on uniforms and go to another part of the world to fight when the ideology that they're fighting started because of a country that is saying that they are our friends. I just can't bear it. And when I left the Department of State, this is a true story, I told Secretary Kerry that as much as I, I, I had, in fact, the best job in government. I really did. I loved what I was doing as special representative. But I told him that it was impossible for me to be honest with the American people who had paid my salary from 2003 until 2014 it would be impossible for me to look at my fellow Americans and not be honest with them about what I saw. So I call it out in the book. And I think that there, I am not calling out um, a, a, a requirement that we are not friendly with Saudi Arabia or we don't do uh, you know, commerce with Saudi Arabia. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying on this issue of the, a 40-year endeavor with billions of dollars spent in many different capacities, it isn't, I wish it had only just been the schools, my friend. It is far more dangerous than that. It is about the way they translate the Quran. It is the way they have eradicated cultural history around the world. Hitler did this too. It is a great technique. If you go into a country and you wash away what came before, you replicate and you tell people who you are and what you need to believe. It is the idea that there is a monolithic Islam when everybody in this room understands that Islam has been on this planet for 1,400 years. It is diverse. And it is also important for us to understand that even though the Treasury Department has done an outstanding job in bringing back the, on the terrorist finance piece, there is still Saudi money that is going around the world through different channels that is building out an opportunity to do these things. I could go on for a long time. But the mm -hmm. point here is that it isn't just me who has seen this. And, and, I, and I state in my book, and I, and I urge you to even forget if, if you don't want to read my book, take a look at the bibliography and take a look at some of the, 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 the scholars who have spoken about this. If it had just been since 9-11, that's one thing. But it is very hard to sponge away 40 years of an effort that has been unbelievably successful around the world. And there are countries right now that we are looking at who are seeing young Muslim popula populations that believe that the only way to be Muslim is to be one thing. And the best strength that America has in fighting the kind of radicalization that we're dealing with, that I dealt with, is to, bend, is to, is to promote not one kind of Islam, not the Sunni Shia stuff, it's to say, we as Americans have no right to be talking about what is pure Islam. We don't do that. We don't do that with Christianity. We don't do that with Hinduism. We don't do that with Buddhism. We are certainly not going to do that with Islam. But what we do say as Americans is that people should have the right to practice their religion freely in any way they want to express it. And when an ally and a friend doesn't allow that, we need to stand up. Good to see a great uh, Naval ROTC contingent here today. Thank you, sirs. Uh, so my question is for all the panelists, but in particular for uh, Director Brendan and uh, Admiral McRaven. Um, the DOD has obviously made the decision to go forward with standing up uh, Space, Space Command. Um, and I've seen estimates on the low end at somewhere around 500 million, uh, less conservative estimates in ex excess of several billion dollars. Uh, my question specifically is this. Do you see that as a potential complication in our efforts to fight, counter, uh, to fight terrorism globally? Or perhaps are there some opportunities to leverage the new assets and technologies that will come from a space command to help the effort to fight uh, terrorism? John, this sounds like yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's right up your alley. 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the fact of the matter is we have a limited amount of resources. So anytime you're going to add something to it, something's going to have to come off the table. Uh, so I, I think, you know, as we're looking at uh, the impact of Space Command on the CT fight or domestic terrorism, whatever it might be, certainly there's going to have to be a give and take. Uh, I mean, the fact is uh, the Air Force does a pretty doggone good job right now of taking care of space. Uh, you know, Bill McRaven's personal opinion is I don't see the need for a Space Command. That's not to say we don't have a lot of interest in space. We absolutely do. Uh, and we need to have people that are focused on it full time. The idea of a of a, a, a subordinate space command or a combatant commander that runs space, I guess that makes some sense. Uh, as long as that individual still continues to focus uh, on, again, that environment. But again, they're gonna have to be linked in very tightly with the broader Air Force, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, et cetera. Uh, so if, if it had been up to me, I would say I, didn't think, I don't think we need an entirely new space uh, service, if you will, or space agency, uh, space service. Um, but somebody that focuses on space, I think that's okay, but it will come at the detriment of something else we're doing. That's just the way it always is. Professor O'Connell down here. Sorry. Get back to you. Hello, everybody. I'm Aaron O'Connell. I teach history here at UT. I've been thinking a lot about the efficacy of military force in the problem of mitigating the terrorist threat. Uh, to take the Admiral's uh, fire brigade metaphor, of course we need a fire brigade, uh, that makes sense. But if that fire brigade is foreign funded, if that fire brigade involves foreign firefighters, I'm wondering if that increases or decreases the us versus them problem we have in many of these countries where people don't trust their governments, don't feel it's serving them, don't feel it's there for them. And when the fire brigade actually involves the taking of life as opposed to just putting out fires, then naturally it's going to have spillover effects on how people think about their government. So I'm not just thinking about here the terrorism, the action, actions of our special operators who occasionally kill terrorists, but the whole provisioning of defense articles and services to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, the very countries where we see, see serious terrorism problems. So can I just ask the, the panel for, for a comment on the efficacy of military force, not just in its usage, but in building up the security services of the very countries that these insurgents are rising up against, and indeed, they're growing in number. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's always a complicated problem. Again, you, got, you have to take on a case-by-case -case scenario. So certainly, if we are building up uh, the resources of a country where terrorism is, is really an insurgency or a civil war, uh, Yemen or someplace like that, well, then you're going to have problems. But the fact of the matter is most of the folks that uh, we are allied with are putting their lives on the line just like our American soldiers are. And I was the commander of the NATO Special Operations Force. And 19, at the time, 19 different um, nations were part of the NATO force that went to Afghanistan. We could not have uh, fought in Afghanistan without our great allies from NATO and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and we had you know, a whole host of uh, Arab and Asian partners that were part of this kind of larger uh, allied force. We have to have those folks, not just for the war and terrorism, but these alliances are, are critically important. Uh, I'm a, a big believer in NATO. And, and I will tell you why uh, it, it is not just that we have had this long-standing relationship. You know, when 9-11 happened, um, the NATO immediately invoked Article 5 of the NATO Charter. But what I, I, I'm quick to point out is that I don't think it had anything to do with Article 5 of the NATO Charter. I think what it had to do was, hey, for 60 years at that point in time, we had been allies and friends and had relationships with our European partners and with our Australian partners and with those that decided to join us in the fight against terrorism. So when we look at these alliances, these crucial alliances around the world, it is not just about a piece of paper, it is not just about a treaty, it is about our values and what our values mean to those people that are part of uh, this broader alliance. We can't fight the war on our own. Uh, we're not always gonna get it right, you know, invariably we're gonna help out a country that turns out to be uh, deceitful and bad, and, and that's, that was maybe the wrong move. We're going to make those mistakes. But I think, in general, these alliances we have are absolutely crucial to fighting the war on terrorism, the war against the, whether, we, whether we have to fight against North Korea, whatever it happens to be, we've got to build these alliances, but they have to be built on mutual trust, on friendships, on personal relationships, on values. If we don't build them on that, 
they will collapse the first round that comes downrange. Just like the U.S. military, the CIA has relationships with maybe over 200 intelligence security services around the world to empower them, to give them capabilities so that they can take care of the challenges that they face. But as importantly, if not more importantly, we try to make sure that we help professionalize those services. Explain to them what their responsibilities are as intelligence officers, make sure that they have appropriate respect for the law as well as humanitarian issues and other things, and try to make sure that they understand that their relationship with us is dependent on their ability to follow through on those commitments that we expect from them to be an intelligence service and not to be just an instrument of an authoritarian regime that's going to suppress and kill their citizenry. We have time for one more question. I'm going to get your student. Good. Tell us what you're studying while the mic comes. Hi, my name is Jonah. I'm studying history and Arabic at UT Austin. I'm curious, I had a question for you, Ms. Pandith, about you, me, American information operations and social media strategy. I'm wondering how can the federal government endorse a bottom-up social media strategy? And then is there any efficacy in America supporting cyber and information uh, domain manipulation to reorient the focus of Islamic jihadists back to local issues rather than global? what Schuer from Imperial Huber is called like near jihad. Curious to hear. A couple of softball questions. Yeah, really, really easy. No, but it's, it's really great. It's a great thing to end on. Um, and, and I'm really delighted you asked the question because um, here's the good news. Uh, after 9-11, when we began to experiment on how to use soft power, we understood very well what, what you heard Mr. Brennan talk about, which is the power of what's happening at the local level. It can't be the American government that comes in that tells locals what to do. We don't have the agency or the, influ or the credibility, that's the right word. We don't have the credibility to be able to go in and tell somebody how to, how to have their identity or how to belong. But what we do have is the power to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. And in the Bush administration, with many of my colleagues on the stage and, and in the audience, we tested um, uh, an idea, which was to say this. Could we build, even, even though the war in Iraq was really unpopular, the war in Afghanistan was really unpopular, would there be a way to build community um, connections, engage with those who actually know more than we do, and, and help their ideas flourish. And we did that. We tested it. How did we? We tested it right after the Danish cartoon crisis. We tested it in Europe. And what we found was that we didn't stamp everything with the American flag. We didn't say, brought to you by. We said, that young person over there in Belgium has an amazing idea. I wonder if we can connect that, him to that person in, uh, in Sicily. Um, what about that woman I just met in Oslo? She might actually have a really great idea for what's happening in Spain. Building networks of like-minded thinkers. And I, I, I raise this because that's our strength. That's what we can do really well. And it connects to your question about the online. In that space of us testing that, we also began to test what was possible online. So we built a network of, of and this is like, you know, we're in 20, 2019, let's go back to when we started this in 2003, 2004, 25. There was no big Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of stuff. But what we did is we tested ideas from communities to say, what do we need to put in an online space that will help a young person that goes, how do I, in, these, in, a, in a moment today, how do I go to Syria? How do we move them away from getting the answers right there? Who began and drove that process? It was the USG. We began to test and market ideas, not because we're super smart and we're the only ones in the world. It's because we were willing to take risks with ideas that came from outside of the halls of uh, policy and the, and the halls of, uh, of academia. We went to communities themselves and said, what you want to do? So today, in 2019, we have lots of examples of what we, what we should be doing in an online space. The problem and the reason why you're not reading about it is because the two words we haven't used today are tempo and scale. We have ad hoc programs that we have tested all over the world, but we have not done it in real time 24-7 so we can measure and see the impact. Um, and, and so I would say to you, it's a promising adventure to think about what might be possible because there are many people that are your age that are looking at the online space on how to, to stop the appeal of that ideology peer to peer, whether you're using former extremists whether you're using new content that comes from influencers and 
working hand in glove with technology companies so the algorithms move you in a different direction or you're experimenting um, in, in, in a way that, um, that I, I mean, we don't have enough time to talk about, but that are specific to slices of community. Can I just say one more thing? Um, culture, we didn't talk about that word. A brand knows segmentation for a particular demographic. So a 20-year-old, they will be able to tell you if you're a 20-year-old in Austin, Texas, and you wear um, you know, this type of sweatshirt, they, a, a marketing company will be able to tell you exactly what else you will buy. You will buy this flavor of Gatorade. You will buy this. They know how it's all connected. We can use that kind of cultural data in the online space to specifically say that that girl in Oregon who searched for ISIS we can get her offline in such a way that she won't find a bad guy on the other side of her computer. Before I thank the panel, I want to give two, oh, Sir Adam Blumen. You're the only one I would go longer for, sir. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. It's got, mic's on the way, sir. <laughs> this isn't a question. Uh, it's advice to the crowd. In 92, 30, I'm sorry, in uh, what year was Clinton elected? 92. 92, you're right. In the spring and summer, 32 of us so-called experts worried about where we saw government going, particularly not dealing with international economic issues, recommended that whoever won in 92 create a National Economic Council, and a Domestic Council. Governor Clinton accepted, did the National Economic Council, never really did the Domestic Council, about that, because it was too closely tied to politics and getting ready for campaigns. I'd make the pitch to you that there's gotta be a top-down part here of structuring, managing the government that overlaps between the domestic, the economic, and the national security if we're going to effectively tackle these problems. So my advice as you sort out your prospective favorite candidate for the next election, don't ask them what their policy is on the environment and debt. So ask them how they plan to organize and structure the government if they get the opportunity to do it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so I'd like to make uh, two sort of public service announcements. First, to plug a presentation that we're going to have uh, this Thursday by uh, General Vince Brooks, who will be speaking, who's here with us today, uh, who will be speaking on the uh, situation in Northeast Asia and Korea in particular, if I have that, if I have that right. Is that in the, is that at uh, Sid Bass, Bass Lecture Hall. And the second thing is to, uh, is to say that um, Farah will be signing her book out there um, in the lobby. Here. Oh, over here, I'm here. sorry, right over here, excuse me. And uh, you're welcome to come up here and, and purchase one and get it signed. Now, help me in thanking this esteemed panel and for the time they've given us today. Thanks, Farah. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, much. very, very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank As you. always, man. Paul, thanks so much. As always, John, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome.